Yesterday afternoon, I was walking the church property, uh, picking up trash. Uh, it's something I do from time to time. Um, as strange as it may sound, uh, that people have a habit of throwing trash out of the window along 5th Street here. Uh, so there comes times when I walk this side of the building and picking up uh, trash. Um, it's extremely often that kids will leave mess from Wednesday nights, uh, mostly drink cups and dessert containers. And um, when I'm, On good weeks, I remember to walk the, the property on Thursdays. Um, on, on bad weeks, I remember, hey, church is tomorrow. I need to go pick those up um, now. Uh, but yesterday, as I was doing that, I was uh, out in the courtyard area, and there was a collection of drink cups. And as I was picking them up, among the drink cups was this cross. Um, this was actually an RA project from last week. Um, I don't want to stretch this too far, uh, but bear with me. Um, I picture a young man that, that made this in Wednesday night Bible study, um, excited about it. Uh, he was excited about the cross, excited about the story of a Savior, I picture him excited about taking this home. I picture him, he's thought about it as he's making it. He's picturing in his room the spot where he's going to place it. Um, and then Bible study's over. He's got the cross in his hand. He takes it out to the playground area. And then a game of football starts up. And the cup is placed down. The cross is placed aside and then forgotten. The symbol of our faith with a bunch of drink cups and dessert containers. I do think it is common for us to place our faith aside when something more fun comes about. I even think it's far too common for us to place our faith aside when something difficult comes about. Today, because of where we are in Mark's gospel, we're going to talk about faith in difficult times. And I think we all have something to gain. I invite you to join me in Mark chapter 5. We'll be picking up the story at verse 21. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. If you've got it open, can I hear an amen? amen. Uh, if you don't have it open, this is one of those that you can follow along with pretty easy. It is quite the story. Mark chapter 5, starting at verse 21. And the scripture says, When Jesus again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. A woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and, and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she had heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see, the people crowding around against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? 
But Jesus kept looking to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. Trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kum which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the little girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. Amen. Quite the story. Um, and quite a long story. And if you look at it, it's actually... Two stories that the Gospel of Mark makes one story, which leads me this morning to talk to you about sandwiches. <laughs> the Gospel of Mark, there's actually fancy terms for this, but this morning we're going to go with the term sandwich. Uh, the Gospel of Mark is actually built around sandwiches. If you read through the Gospel of Mark, it is his technique. He will start a story, insert a story, and then complete the first story. Um, it's as if sometimes he gives us a cliffhanger. He'll begin one, insert one, and then finish it. Or sometimes he'll take a story and he'll put it right in the middle of stories with similar themes. And if we're reading closely, it's the Gospel of Mark's way to send us a message in a very subtle and powerful way. We think we're just reading a story, but then when we look back at what we've read, Mark has told us this time and time again. So let us look really quickly at the sandwich that was in front of us a moment ago. We can recap it Quickly, we um, hear the story of Jesus crossing the lake. And that's a, if you're reading through the Gospel of Mark with this sermon series, that's something we hear over and over again. Mark is going back and forth, back and forth over this lake. And here he is. Can we pray for my clicker here? There we go. So we get this story again. Jesus has gone across the lake. And then we're introduced to Jairus, this man who falls at Jesus' feet and prays for his daughter. He pleads for his dying daughter. It's just not going to work today, folks. That's the top piece of the bread. We are introduced to Jairus. He has a daughter who's sick, and he comes to Jesus wanting her to be healed. And then Jesus makes his way to Jairus' house, and then we're introduced to a woman who's had this issue of bleeding for some time. She's done everything she can. She spent all of her money in the doctors, but it just keeps getting worse. She touches Jesus, and she's healed. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus makes his way back to, all keeps going on his way to Jairus' house. The daughter who was sick has now died, and Jesus provides healing for her bottom piece of the sandwich. And right there in the middle, we have this line that stands out through it all. Jesus tells this woman, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed 
from your suffering. That grabs us, right? It stands out right in the middle of this story. Go. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. That leads us this morning to a very significant conversation about faith. But it's not the first conversation about faith we've had. We're hitting some high points in Mark's gospel, but we've already been at this spot in Mark chapter 2 where these men have a paralyzed friend and they believe Jesus can heal him. So what do they do? They take their paralyzed friend on a mat, they climb a roof, they dig a hole, they lower the friend down. And what does Jesus say? The text says he sees their faith and says to them, Son, your sins are forgiven. He sees their faith and then Jesus heals the sin. And then last week we were reading the story about the disciples in a boat and a furious squall came up. Don't we love that word? This furious squall comes up and these professional fishermen are absolutely in a panic and they're bailing water out of the boat and eventually they give up hope. They turn to Jesus and say, don't you care if we drown? Jesus looks at them and says, why are you so afraid? Do you have no faith? And then today, we get these two stories of people demonstrating remarkable faith. And that line of Jesus in the middle rings in our ears. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. This leads us to a few points. If you've got your bulletin open, your, your GPS has a place for you to fill in some blanks. From all these stories that we've seen in faith, and from our passage today in particular, we see that faith is the gateway for the power of God. Faith is the gateway for the power of God. That it's through faith that God gives power to the powerless. Mm Mm-hmm. Notice how I'm phrasing that. I'm being very intentional on how I'm phrasing that. It is through faith that God gives power to the powerless. We don't get to take any credit for that. We don't get to boast of our faith because it's through faith that God gives power to the powerless. Without faith, no power. With faith, we are granted the power that God provides. God has this power, and it is through our faith that he delivers it to us. Faith is the gateway for the power of God, and faith requires action. You might push back on me on that one, but what do you mean by that? Faith is not a work. It's not something we do. How can you say faith requires action? I'm just reading these stories we've read thus far, right? Four friends have faith in God. They have faith in Jesus. They have faith that Jesus can heal them. So what do they do? They take their friend and get him to Jesus. Jairus in our story this morning, has faith that Jesus can provide healing. So what does he do? He seeks Jesus out and falls at his feet and pleads for Jesus to heal. This woman in our story today, it's in faith that she reaches out and touches the cloak of Jesus and then identifies herself among the crowd. I don't want to get too far away from our passage today, but we'll get into, you keep reading your New Testament, you'll get into this amazing passage of faith in Hebrews 13, where the, the writer of Hebrews lists out all these figures in our scriptures that lived by faith. And it's by faith, Abraham did this. And it's by faith, Noah did this. And it describes their faith by the action they took, trusting in God. So 
So my question this morning, what is it that you do in faith? <coughs> what is it that you do because of the fact that you have placed your life firmly into the hands of God? You see the, the tension I'm drawing here? We can say we're people of faith. We can say that all day long. The Bible says people are of faith when they actually live that faith out. Mm -hmm. What is it that you do because you have placed your faith, placed your trust, placed your life into the hands of of God. You can't be a person of faith without walking in faith. Mm -hmm. it leads us to the, the last fill in the blank here. Uh, faith is belief that Jesus is sufficient. It, and I don't mean that in, in a casual way. Like, okay, I guess Jesus will suffice. It means that Jesus is sufficient. You don't need Jesus in anything else. Mm -hmm. But Jesus is enough. You can't be a person of biblical faith and then place your faith in something other than Jesus Christ. You can't be a person of biblical faith and place your faith in someone or something other than Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, and I love the way this passage describes that for us. You, you, you have a woman who encounters Jesus that has spent all of her money. She has gone broke because doctors have been unable to heal. No offense to the doctors in the room. I know we've got a couple. No offense. It's, just, it's what the Bible says, right? And she's gone broke, spending her money on doctors who could not heal her. But Jesus was more powerful. Jesus was sufficient. And then in a subtle way, I love the Jairus story. Jairus comes to Jesus because his daughter is what? Sick. Jesus, heal her. While Jesus is healing the woman with the blood issue, Jairus' buddies come and say, don't bother Jesus, she's died. The friends try to tell Jairus, just give up hope. It's too far gone now. Right? Jesus might have helped a day ago. Jesus might have helped a couple of hours ago, but now she's dead. Don't bother Jesus. But Jesus is more powerful. Jesus is sufficient. When we read these scriptures uh, that describe people of faith, describe instances of faith, it's not Jesus and something else. Is not Jesus plus something else. Jesus is sufficient. It is as we have sung all morning long that there's salvation in the name of Jesus. We don't sing there's salvation in the name of Jesus and something else. We don't sing there's salvation in the name of Jesus plus something else. Jesus is sufficient. You still with me? Give me an amen. 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 So we read, thank you, thank you Jesse. Uh, so we get these two stories of faith. And it would be very easy for us this morning to then take Mark chapter 5 and allow it to lead us down dangerous roads. So we're going to have to spend a minute on this. It, it's far too easy to read Mark chapter 5, these, this sandwich we've read this morning, it's far too easy to take it and misapply it. We can all agree that heaven is perfect. Amen? But Crawford, Texas is not heaven. Can we agree on both of those points? Right, Heaven is perfect, but Crawford, Texas is not perfect. Crawford, Texas is a broken place. This is a place where we will encounter sin and brokenness. 
friends and family. I mean, just describing life here on earth, describing life here in Crawford, Texas. We will experience sin and brokenness. Our friends and family will get sick. We live in a world where little children die. And that's reality. And it'd be easy for us to read Mark chapter 5 and pretend that those things don't happen. But we've all been on the receiving end of a phone call that brings bad news. And that puts us into conflict right here with Mark chapter 5. What do we do? Mark chapter 5 talks about faith and healing. Faith and things going well. Well, what about my real life? How do those things rub against each other? Well, Mark chapter 5 is not intending to give us an explanation of why evil happens to God-fearing people. Mark chapter 5 is not trying to tell us why, as God-fearing people, life kicks us in the teeth. It's not its purpose. Mark chapter 5 is also not telling us that if we're of enough faith, that life's troubles are just going to go away. You know, if I just have enough faith, all these problems will go away. Mark chapter 5 is not telling us that either, because we know the end of the gospel, right? Jesus eventually is going to die on the cross. Right? We keep reading the New Testament, all of the disciples are going to face similar deaths. All right, if we get into the book of Acts, we're going to read the stories of the early church being persecuted. These are people of faith, and life still happens. So what is Mark 5 trying to tell us about faith? I don't do this often, but I'm going to put a quote on the screen. I, I do this. I'll give you a preface of why I do this, and you can thank me later. Um, I'm going to put a quote on the board that's uh, two sentences. Um, before I put this quote on the screen, it took me like 45 minutes to preach it, right? And I stumbled across the quote, and I said, that'll save the church 45 minutes. So, so, so here's the quote um, from David Garland. He's a biblical scholar. He, he's actually down the road at Truth Seminary at Baylor University. He says, a miracle does not occur in every situation, but it does not lessen God's power to save. If God intervened in every situation we would never have to exercise faith. Do we, do we catch that? Mark chapter 5 is the description of two people in the midst of life circumstances. And they demonstrate faith by going to the one that has the power to change it. Mark chapter 5 isn't telling us that if we just have enough faith, all of life's troubles are going to go away. But Mark chapter 5 is telling us that if we are facing times of trouble, we have someone to go to. I should have got at least two amen. I mean, I think it was worth five, but I've set the bar at maybe two. All right? Are we getting this? Amen. Amen. That in times of trouble, we go to the one with the power to change things. In times of trouble, we go to the one who has the power to save. Amen. And it's in that that we demonstrate faith. Mark chapter 5 is not telling us about why evil happens. Mark chapter 5 is not trying to dismiss things of life. But it is telling us that God is with us in suffering. And it tells it to us in a dramatic way that God is with us in suffering no matter who you are. Right? And, the, and Mark chapter 5 gives us two demonstrations. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter your social status. 
Mm-hmm. Right? God was with Jairus, the respected official synagogue leader. <coughs> and God was with the unnamed woman who was broke and ill. Mm-hmm. God was with them both. Mm-hmm. So in times of trouble, let us not leave our faith among drink cups and dessert containers. But in moments of faith, let us cling to God, the one who is with us, and the one who has the power to change things. I'll make this real quick. Um, If you keep reading, we read this Mark and Sandwich in Mark chapter 5. If you roll right into Mark chapter 6, this is how we'll conclude this morning. If you roll right into Mark chapter 6, you get a story. While 5 was amazing faith, you get a lack of faith in Mark 6. Mark 6 begins this way. Jesus left there and went to his home town, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, (laughs) among his relatives, and in his home. Here's the kicker, verse 5. He could not do any miracles there, except lay on a few hands and heal sick people. (laughs) He was amazed at their lack of faith. Hmm. This morning, let us be a church that demonstrates the faith of Mark chapter Mm 5. And let us repent of the lack of faith of Mark chapter (coughs) 6. Let us place our faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Let me just connect a dot real quick. If you weren't here, why is Jesus performing healings? Mark chapter 2 taught us it's much easier to just heal a physical body. Only God can forgive sins. Only God can provide forgiveness of sin. Jesus heals physically to prove that he can heal spiritually. We've already learned in the gospel that those who are healed physically will one day die. But those who are healed spiritually, those who have had their sins forgiven, will live forever. Mm -hmm. And that's what Jesus is after. Mm -hmm. And that's why, that's why it's okay. That's why it's okay if the miracle doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Because those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ will live forever due to the forgiveness of sin provided by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. May we be people of faith. Mm -hmm. Let us pray.